Hey everybody, welcome to Fatherhood Fables, and we are going to jump straight into what is Fatherhood Fables and how did it come to be? So I actually recently had a conversation with one of my buddies, Michael Buss. He actually is the one who kind of realized, hey, it might be helpful to have an episode to learn about where Fatherhood Fables came from. Uh, really just an origin story. So I wish it was closer to like a Wolverine or, you know, something epic. I love a good old origin story, hey? Don't we all? But um, he's going to just kind of ping off some stuff we've been talking about and connecting on and some questions. And I just felt like this could be a, a cool format to jump in. Most of the episodes will probably going forward will be different interviews with some of my favorite dads. Uh, I actually want Bus to jump in every once in a while and uh, ask me some questions as we go through different series and stuff. But um, I think this will just be a great way for us to be able to get a conversation started about fatherhood fables. So how you doing, Bus? Ryan, I'm doing great. Awesome. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be a part of the conversation. Bro, it's like almost, what, 930 at night? Yep, getting it in. Yeah, you know the kids go to bed and this is what we do. That's it. That's it. I mean, maximize on the time. You don't have any kids, so that's that's. I don't very know what true. you do at nine thirty, but you know, I'm editing photos. I'm I still work, baby. Okay, keep that's it going. true. You yeah, you yeah. burn the midnight oil. I do. I do. I get stuff done. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, creatives. It's true. I remember those days when it's like, well, you know, I could just uh, totally open up the laptop and get yeah. another hour in. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. It's, it's real. I mean, I even, I do that still, even with with kids, and it's fun though. Sometimes, I honestly. To my, my wife's demise, I find some of my most creative fun work happens between like, I don't do it often, but I love a good jam session from like 12 to 1. So yes, this is us jamming. On, That's it. We've never done this, but we're going to do it. So here we are. Bus, how, how do you want to do this, man? Yeah. I mean, kind of you prefaced it, but just starting with, I'd love to hear about where did the idea of doing a podcast called Fatherhood Fables even come from? Great question, man. I will try to keep this short because I've, over time, as I've ex uh, explained this to f different people and, and friends, like, hey, I got this idea. I uh, hopefully have come up with a more succinct way of, of getting through because it has quite a bit of my personal journey in it. Sure. So I was working for a company for about uh, just under seven years doing, doing film and uh, post-production, so editing, color correction running a team in the last couple of years that I was working on some long form projects. And as I started to realize the toll it takes um, on, on two of these, these projects, which was an amazing experience. Like I, I definitely would not give up that experience and the things I've learned. Um, so I like to say in the trenches, right? Uh, I realized that one of the things I was super passionate about was wanting to to do more of was be a dad i mean obviously once you're a dad you're always a dad but really spending more of my time than i was you know when you work a nine mm -hmm. to five or in that case you know i was working 10 hour days on these films uh i started having this longing for you know being with my kids home life so that started a little bit of a conversation among some of my, my buddies talking about hey how do you do film and and fatherhood you know well do the two coexist at all Honestly, they were super helpful because it gave me hope for the idea of, hey, can you have a film career possibly and also have a family and, and be a, a, an excellent dad? Sure. Film so, industry is crazy. What's that? The film industry is crazy. Oh, film industry. I mean, it's very common knowledge almost that, you know, trying to work in, let's call it Hollywood, while trying to have a, a successful family. I think that's the difference sometimes is... yeah. What's the difference between just having a family and a successful family? And hopefully our goal is to have successful, but I don't want to have a mediocre family. Like that's not my goal, right? Yeah, no. Yeah, it, it was some some great conversations that were started and I was cruising along on these films. Got a call. I was actually on holiday. So we, my wife and I, because we both were working full time, we always take a pretty big holiday to go see our family in South Africa. Yeah. When I say holiday, it's vacation. I'm starting to use my yeah, yeah. South African lingo here. So um, it was uh, in South Africa, and I got a call that my dad was diagnosed with stage four cancer, mm. which was a complete shock. He hadn't been feeling well for a couple of weeks before we had left, but you know it was kind of like flu symptoms, whatever. So it turned out to be um, stage four cancer, and it felt crazy to be away, literally halfway around oh the world, gosh. and getting this this call. So um. Came back and I would say 
at that point in my life, for sure, the hardest year of my life. Sure. So I was working 10 hour days on this project. And uh, even to go back to rewind a little bit more, I had just had my, our second, so our daughter in 2017, she was born with uh, Down syndrome. We only found out when she was born. And I could, I could, as you know, my heart, yeah. bro, like yeah, yeah. there's going to be lots of beautiful conversations and things that uh, we'll, we'll bring up in, in future episodes. She's the but, best. Um, she is literally the best. She is the joy of my life. To give a little more context to that, on top of just the diagnosis, my sister, Sarah, actually had Downs, or mm. still has. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but you grew up yeah. with the older sister who had Down syndrome. No, I mean, so there is so much history. Yeah. And just and now uh, all of a sudden, your daughter has yeah. Down syndrome. No, I, and I actually told my, my wife well, when we drove Liberty home, I said, I feel like I'm driving my sister home from the hospital. Wow. My wife had some beautiful things to say about that, but definitely, definitely put a little bit of like some pressure on the, my internal, like, oh, do I have what it takes? But uh, yeah, that was kind of when I started to feel the weight of life a little bit. You know, sure. I was just thinking about yeah. this yesterday, actually, well, at least for me in my twenties, uh, I was on cruise mode, bro. I was just like cruise control. Yeah. A lot of things, you know, you get married, I got married young uh, and it's just, it's a beautiful season of life. And then, so this was all happening right around my late 20s into just my 30s and um I started like wow this is this is the the real things of life so daughter you know was born with downs uh which again I'm not trying to make that a, a negative thing it just was very unexpected sure yeah and so just realized my my wife and I were both carrying the weight of that a little bit of like what does this mean mm -hmm. um and to give context to that too my my sister has down syndrome yeah so i i was just trying to get out of this thing of like i have some context yeah. A lot of context for what it looks like to live with someone with, mm -hmm. with special needs. But now that's my daughter, like, I just feel very responsible. Don't know what this is going to look like. Sure. And like all these things, right? So carrying that in my heart for a year, started this film project 2018 in it, feeling like, wow, this is heavy. This is, you know, a lot for, for my family because talk about sleep training. Let's talk about all those things on top of yeah. my wife and I just working full full weeks and i'm working a 50 hour week right now on this this project who <laughs> start early you know early in the morning i'm barely seeing my kids in the morning my wife's trying to get kids to preschool and stuff and i, I just I, I gotta be at work so i'm always just feeling like hey i'm leaving her shorthanded i mean everything just felt hard i mean uh i remember walking into these early morning sessions with the director it was actually a very good friend of mine and <laughs> I mean, we, we still say, it's funny, when we, when we see David and Ronnie and I see each other, we still make the joke that in these two years on this project, we absolutely saw more of each other in those two years than we saw our wives. Wow. Because you're in the it grind. to win it. Oh, it's the grind. We're in the trenches. So uh, anyways, but a few few morning sessions where I would just literally ball my eyes out and then we'd jump into scene, you know, Sheesh. 10A or whatever and start yeah. cutting. And yeah, if, if you've ever had... A loved one that's been on the journey of, of fighting cancer it's kind of a day-to-day -day thing sometimes especially stage four you know it's yeah it can it can vary as far as expectancy and all that so my dad fought on did did uh chemo and and all that and i in the middle of all this i started to realize um because of the conversations i had been having about wanting to be a dad in a bigger capacity that i could feel my time at this company was coming to an end, but I didn't want to just make that choice. I wanted to feel the Lord leading me into a new season yeah. and really out of the season I was in. So I kind of, I put that in front of the Lord and uh, actually had a really um, clear dream from the Lord. So one of the ways the Lord speaks to me the most in, in big decisions, which I'm so grateful for is mm. in dreams. So I had a dream and uh, it was probably January of, of 2019. And it, it was the pivotal thing that kind of pushed me forward. So I cool. uh, gave my, my four weeks you know, notice uh, top of, of May that, um, that year. And May, May 31st was my last day. That was actually the last day I had a coherent, like full conversation with my dad. At the time, I didn't know it was the last conversation wow. I was going to have with him. And we were actually leaving for South Africa again for the summer, just for a couple mm -hmm. weeks. I was kind of, should I, should I go? Cause I don't know where my dad's at. Like, am I being irresponsible? Like as yeah, a son, yeah, you know, sure. and the last conversation I had with my dad was where 
he told me, uh, that had just been my last day at work. And he said, hey, son, a lot of men have a gun, but they don't know how to pull the trigger or don't or won't pull the trigger essentially. And I knew what he was saying to me was he was proud of me making this decision of wow. leaving the nine to five, leaving the security of that yeah, and jumping into something unknown. But he knew that was what was in my heart and mm-hmm. it was going to be a great move for my family and stuff. So, I, I mean, I still look back at that conversation and it's an anchor yeah. in my soul for, a lot of things, including fatherhood fables. So yeah. I went to South Africa uh, and realized that my dad was actually fading fast back home. So it was facilitating a lot of the kind of, you know, the things that you, you prepare for. And um, we stayed the whole time. My dad actually told me once on the phone, you need to stay. This is your, your vacation. Mm. Don't come back on account of me. And I really, I felt I wanted to trust my dad on that. And we um, got back when we flew into San Francisco, I actually found out that my dad was probably within 24 to 36 hours wow. of, of passing. He passed a couple of days later. I got to to be with him in those last moments, which, you know, was incredible. Uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> incredible as in being there. I don't know if you've totally, ever been, yeah. been near someone when they're passing. But so it's a really kind of crazy thing when they you actually know what's about to happen. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's one of the most amazing moments of my life of feeling my dad cross into eternity. You know, obviously there's grief and things rushing in. As a dad, I think you don't always know how to process that. As a husband, you don't always know how to engage in that conversation. Sure. Obviously my wife knows I'm, I'm grieving and all of that. But I, I think I, I never really had good communication with needs. Even through most of my marriage, I was one of the things I I had to work on the most was having needs in general. I would just stuff things because I I was honestly what was modeled to me. And I thought that was the way that uh, things were handled. So, so I jumped into freelancing and started to freelance in, in film. I was loving it. You know, my goal was to work about 10 to 15 hours a week on projects and then be, be a dad. So my wife was still working full time. So I was taking care of kids, school drop-offs and pickups. So January of 2020, surprise oops baby and uh yeah ash is ash is incredible nothing oops about him but uh just unplanned unplanned yeah Yeah. unexpected a little malfunction there so (laughs) um yeah that that kind of felt like oh wow weren't expecting it yeah and just everything was mounting and i could feel the last five years of my life was just that 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 part i had never really processed was just sitting there so Mm. We went on a baby moon slash my wife's 30, whatever. I don't forget how old she was turning, but we went to Cancun. Yeah. So we kind of, in our anniversary, uh, we just kind of lumped it all into the month of August, which that's not when we got married. But you know, you know, when you get, when you have totally, kids, you totally. just kind of go, hey, take what you can get. That's right. Take what you can get. So we're in Cancun and I realize, holy cow. I don't know how to. I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to feel like I'm on vacation. I don't know how to unwind right now. And you only felt this once you could kind of stop. I've been vacation. I've been feeling versions of it, but okay. once I got there, I just pretty much melted. Wow, the great burnout of 2020. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and anyways, comical now, not so comical then. Yeah, no, no, it's it's all retro retrospective. Uh, I can laugh about it now. Mm-hmm. So for some full context. You know, we go back to 2018. Summer of 2018 was when we had the car fire here in Reading. So, you know, it was like a crazy amount of time uh, between the actual fire happening where, you know, we had friends who didn't know if their houses were left. That happens. My kids all have, you know, reactive airways, breathing stuff that's happening from smoke that is just in the air for months at a time. So I'm sleeping on their floor for, for like four, five, six weeks, just, you know, nebulizing, giving them stuff throughout the night, making sure they're breathing. Um, and obviously COVID happens, uh, the beginning of COVID happens 2019. And then, you know, in context of all these other things that are happening between, um, you know, my dad being diagnosed, me working on two films back to back. It was just, as I'd like to say, it was, I was just in the soup for, for two, three years. So I tell my wife on this this holiday, this vacation in Cancun, I say, babe, I feel like all I've tried to do over the last couple of years is fill the crevices of everything that feels sure, sure. 
like the things that I don't feel in control of because of the craziness of what life has been. And I realized that I'm not doing well. Mm. So Ash was due at that point in three months. And I think I was feeling the pressure of third baby. I'm about to be outnumbered. Uh, I never really fully processed what I really felt about libs being born with downs and all the connotations of that from my childhood. Yeah. On top of uh, some of the stuff still with, with my dad and the grief of that. So I had, I mean, the best term I can come up with is a burnout. Yeah. And that was definitely the, the darkest of any season of my life. And I, you know, it was a good six months of just kind of taking it day by day. I had an amazing therapist that helped me through a lot of, a lot of those, those moments and things that I needed to let go of. And if you've ever found yourself in that, that dark place, you kind of go, you're redefining all the boundaries of what am I capable of and what am I passionate about? And, you know, it's part of the thing that gives you directive and like vision out of that season. Yeah. Yeah. So as I I was looking for that vision to like propel me out of that season, now granted, I think it's always healthy to do a kind of a crawl, walk, run, don't, you know, find you to like, Hey, I'm going to run a marathon or whatever. Uh Just like, you know, take, take your baby steps. But, um, well, I love what about Bob, right? You know, baby steps here. So, (laughs) so I'd realized for most of my life, like I could relate to Jesus pretty well yeah like jesus i love you you know the holy spirit love the holy spirit love Mm. miracles signs wonders like you know i love those two parts of the trinity i love the father but i didn't know the father very well sure and it probably didn't feel like i had access to him and maybe just because of religion and church culture and how i grew up like a little bit more of a shadowy you know yeah yeah what is that what does it look like to be in relationship with father god and and I read one day uh, in my devotionals, Paul's writing to one of the churches and he says, my desire for you is that you are fathered by God himself. And I realized in this moment that in the loss of, with the loss of my father and f- me feeling the, the weight of, of being a, a father, yeah. uh, I was like, oh, like, this is actually where I get to be fathered by God himself. And I found myself in this amazing place where I actually was hearing the voice of the father more clearly than I ever had in my life. One of the things that I I really feel as I look back at that season was, again, yes, I had an amazing therapist. Uh, My wife was absolutely incredible, such a support and all my friends around me. But the thing that I look back at that season and I'm amazed at is that Father God actually wants to meet us in our weakness. I think about the scripture that uh, it says, our weakness, in our weakness, it becomes a portal for God's strength, for his strength to show up in our lives. And I think one of the biggest things I learned was even in our weakest moments is when God wants to bring great victories and come meet us in our humanity to give us vision and hope in life. Like he's not afraid of those places. He's not uncomfortable with our humanity and our needs. He actually meets us in those, those places and wants to father us through that. So just wanted to say before we move forward with this origin story for fatherhood fables, if anyone listening is feeling in a similar place where You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a burnout per se, but a place where you feel discouraged, uh, anxiety with just all of the the things that you're facing. Uh, You know, I was facing panic attacks and uh, racing thoughts and just uh, I was absolutely um, not coping. And I encourage you to lean into the voice of the father. He is the one who wants to father you through. And he actually will meet you in, in your place of, of struggle and weakness. And that actually will become a place where his power is demonstrated. And uh, like I said, I look back at this, this season of my life and it, I feel like I built an altar of remembrance, just like the Israelites did in the Old Testament. Actually, this is a season and a place in my life where I have a, a, an altar of remembrance for what God has done. And it, it's something that I feel like 
uh, he wants to do in other people's lives because um, this is what he does. He he doesn't just uh, fix broken things; he redeems them and he actually makes things new. So that is really the the big part of my story to to get us to fatherhood uh, being one of the center stones, if not one of the cornerstones of of who I am. So fatherhood fables really is a culmination of events of you. You've always had a priority to be present dad, but it, it got switched over the last couple of years as the number one thing that you want to do and you want to be. So that's where you would say this came out of these last four years. Yeah. So I realized that the thing I was most passionate about was, was being a father. I'm like, Hey, I want to have a conversation about this with people. Uh, as a storyteller, I think that's where really the fatherhood fables part comes from. Mm. And I really wanted to find a name and, and, a, a, and something that encompassed who I was as a storyteller. Because yeah. I, I want to tell, as the tagline of, of fatherhood fables is, is telling the stories of strong fathers. Because mm. I think there's power, as we say, there's power in the testimony, there's power in the story. Yeah. And uh, I want to show people what it looks like to have successful families, or at least have conversations about what that could look like. Cause you know, I'm only, I'm in the middle of my journey yeah. in some ways, you know, Ash is one. So I'm still at the beginning of some of this. Yeah. Don't have all the answers, but I'm wanting to have a conversation about how, how could we do, how can we do this? You know? Yeah. So that gives us all frame of reference for kind of where fatherhood fables came from. And now here we are at kind of the precipice of launching it, of, of starting out. So why, why should people care? Why does this conversation where does it have place? Where does it add value to society? So I think one of the things that we're facing right now in, in our culture, in the world, is the, the lack of, of fathers. I mean, I don't have the statistic in front of me, but I think it's close to like somewhere in the 40s. I think last time I, I heard kids just don't literally have dads that are present in their life growing up. And it attributes to so many of just the issues that you know kids are facing. Um, I think fathers are a huge, huge deal yeah. in the, the next coming generations. And they, they shape, I mean, we shape our kids. Like, yeah. like I said, my, my greatest accomplishment will be my children more than the projects I land or the mm-hmm. awards I receive. Um, that's all great and dandy, but I'm like, I, my kids will be the thing that I, I want to have go, wow, this, their reflection of me, the reflection of the Lord, the reflection of what I've poured myself into, you know? So I think what will happen is if we can have these conversations and hopefully not just conversations, but like, I really see this as a a linking up of, of men, of families, of people across the world. Like I want to be able to strengthen families through the conversations we have on fatherhood fables. I want to have the nitty gritty conversations of not just, it's not, it's not a parenting podcast. I'm like, my heart is to talk about, being a man, what does it look like to, to carry the weight of, of a family and do that well without feeling like the only thing you can be is, is a knight on a white horse, you're right? Like yeah. what happens if you need to get off that horse to take a piss? Yeah. <laughs> it's really important as I've found out that you need to, to have real conversations with your brothers, with your spouses, yeah. that we learn to have conversations that are vulnerable and real about raising families and being being men of honor and what does this look like you know because i find the more that i have the these conversations and and begin to to open up on these topics the more i feel encouraged Mm. and i think it's just really important that we we have these conversations really so yeah yeah totally and you know for me as a single guy, not married, doesn't have kids, mid twenties. Um, I'm not quite there yet as far as the drip, drip, drip or the responsibilities or the things of life catching up to me. But, you know, throughout history, even looking at tribal cultures, uh, there's always an initiation into manhood and uh, fatherhood being a man. It, it historically is never done in the context of self or being alone. It's always in the context of community. And so I find myself on the the brink, you know, mid twenties, looking to men. And yes, I had a fantastic father who was super present, 
But I know being around conversations like this and from the other men that are in my life, so valuable for me um, because I, I don't want to do this by myself. And I do want to be successful. I do want to live a wholehearted life. Um, and so having these conversations, being around these conversations, I think add tremendous value for me on a personal level, let alone you know the rest of the listeners and their families and future kids and whatnot and forever how long this podcast goes on for. Forever. So, forever. Yeah, it's, it's encouraging to hear, man, because that, that's my heart. Yeah. Honestly, I'd love to have you on for a couple couple episodes of the whole context of like, hey, what does it look like for, for men to feel empowered going into being a dad, being a husband? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I personally wish I had some more of these conversations. Sure. I didn't, I don't know who to turn to. I had some great, I had a few great conversations, but I wish I had another handful of them Yeah. back yeah. when I was 21 when I got married. So yeah, hopefully it's going to be enriching. Yeah. Helpful. The minimal thing I, I can get across is it's helpful for a few people. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's great. Hopefully we get to have some fun along the way though. Hopefully we get to have some fun and contribute to a new narrative around what being a father means and what being a man means. Absolutely, man. Well, thanks. Uh, Thanks for doing this with me, bro. Oh, absolutely, Ryan. Thanks for having me, bro. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us. And I will see you for the next episode. <laughs>